all guys. You right. lent money to people like him and now lend to lots of people. Could you have built the bank the way you did with today's no. rules? No, I was just listening to Mike talk. BBT started as a small business bank. My first 10 years, all I did was make loans to small businesses, a lot of them farmers. It would be very difficult to do what we did then today. It, it was semi-venture capital thing because the government regulations are so tight, including setting credit standards, and that's very scary. Particularly since the, the, the so-called financial crisis, uh, in the sense that they've come in and changed the credit standards in the banking industry, making it very hard for banks to finance small businesses. I can see my Occupy Wall Street viewers saying, good, because their lack of standards, standards is what led to the implosion in 2008. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I don't think that's true. I, I, here's the, what caused the financial crisis was a combination of the Federal Reserve printing too much money because we didn't want to have a correction. It led to a bubble in the residential real estate market in subprime housing. That was generated by a long-term government policy that goes all the way back to Lyndon Jane Bank Johnson trying to raise home ownership above what's called the natural market rate. Plus and, Fannie and Freddie and, and guaranteeing through, all through this stuff. Fannie and Fannie. So it wasn't small business lending that caused the crisis. It was government policy and housing. John, 90 percent of the banks in this country are less than a billion dollars. It's the small guys that are, have 37 employees and less than a billion dollars of assets where you go down and look the guy eye to eye that is the ones that do it. It's a very simple process. Small banks give small loans to small young companies and out of that group of things are the job producers. All right, and you didn't intend to be. You were at Harvard Law School. And you <laughs> didn't intend to become an entrepreneur. What happened? Uh, I spent one uh, summer as an intern in a law firm, and I said, I'm going to go crazy doing this. And uh, my favorite toy growing up was my train set. Uh, I started a restaurant, which was just like my big train set. I got to play with it every day, and I got to pick who I played with. Right now, we're building a an all-green hotel that's going to have solar hot water heating and LED lighting throughout. And because it ought fun. to or because you're getting subsidies from the taxpayer? Because we're having a lot of fun doing it and it's going to be a cool product when we're done. How did you become the head of a monstrously successful bank? Well, I, when I joined BB&T, it was a really small bank and uh, I worked up through the organization really trying to develop myself, to tell you the truth. I had a very... People, Students ask me, did I try to, did I want to be CEO and I want to make a lot of money? Well, I like being CEO and I like making a lot of money, but that was never my goal. My goal was to do anything I did better than anybody else had ever done it, to be right, world standard. That's the goal of a lot of people working in business. Did you have to suck up to your bosses, no. or how come you reached the top? You know, I did a lot of self-development. I'm, I'm interested, I, I read a lot, I spent a lot of time uh, working on p my personal leadership development. I've been a time studying philosophy to try to get a, a set of principles that we used in our business. And I even did some what's called self-awareness because I was really good at math and I wasn't so strong working with people. Business people are motivated by money, but business people are mostly motivated by building. It's just fun. It we want to create jobs. And, and this is something people don't understand. In a true free market, there is no real unemployment. Businesses will create jobs. It's government obstacles one way or another that create all unemployment, except that some people are changing jobs, but what we call structural real unemployment. Businesses love creating jobs because it's fun. Well, thank you for creating those jobs. John Allison and Mike Whalen, stand by. We have more for you later. But next, some of the best and brightest in the world want to work for these CEOs, but they cannot. I'll explain why when we come back. I keep hearing there aren't enough available jobs. That's why Americans are suffering and unemployment stays pretty high. But there are jobs out there. At Monster.com, we just looked, there are more than a million listings. Computer network engineer, 71000 bucks a year. Technical analyst, $40,000. Truck driver, $40,000. Clerical data entry, $10 to $14 an hour. Entry-level jobs, dishwasher, $8 an hour. Companies tell us we have jobs to offer. Problem is, there is some work Americans, some Americans don't want to do, and many other jobs they're not qualified for. CEOs tell us they often have good jobs for people like engineers, computer scientists, and if they could fill them, they'd grow their companies and hire more Americans. And it turns out there are computer scientists and engineers who want that job, so why don't they hire them? Well, tonight's show is an all-CEO show, so let's ask two of them. 
Joining us again, the founder of Staples, Tom Stenberg, he's now a venture capitalist, and David Park of Austin Capital. So why don't we hire these people? Well, I think one of the problems that we have within this particular economy is just a lack of certain skilled labor, in particular when it comes to engineering and programming. And I think one of the, the problems that we're facing today is that people want overall immigration reform before trying to get some of these people to come to the United States, give them a work visa. But the truth of the matter is, is that these particular engineers will create jobs in America for Americans. I hear they steal jobs. That was a job that might have gone to an American. For every engineer that we hire in the United States, there will probably be about six or seven other types of manufacturing jobs that we can bring back from China, from India, from these other types of countries. There's all this conversation about illegal immigration. But the truth of the matter is, is that we have a great, great uh, shortage of skilled labor in this country, in particular in, in engineering. So unless we fundamentally change something about our educational system to build more engineers, we are going to continue to lose these jobs because what we're doing is, you know, these immigrants are coming into the United States, being educated. And, and then they foreign go, students now earn three-fourths of the doctorates in right. American universities in mathematics and computer and you know science. What? And, and they're they going go to work over here, but what do they do? They go back to where they came from, and they compete against us. And because they can't get visas to stay here. And you know, this well, you know, one, one other argument, though, is that some of them might come here to murder us. You know, there's always a risk that there's a bad apple out there. But what we're doing is we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Just give you an example. If you want to come across the border from Canada today, uh, you get hassled incredibly. I'm on the board of Lululemon, which is based in Vancouver, but is a very fast-growing company in the United States, adding tons of very high-paying jobs here in the United States. Their executives have a heck of a time coming across the border, and it gets worse. From There's, Canada. From Canada. Their CFO was coming here to speak to investment analysts in New York. They held him up the border for eight hours and demanded that he get a work permit. Now, I've done business in Germany, France, England. Nobody's ever asked me to get a work permit. It's ridiculous, perhaps with good intentions, but ridiculous. It gets worse. The state of New York tries to figure out when you were here so they can charge you a tax for the four days you spent here. Now, Lulu has stores here, at least. Other companies don't even have stores here. The state of New York is chasing them to try to collect taxes from them. We have gone from one of the most business-friendly countries in the world to one of the most unfriendly countries in the world. Other countries encourage entrepreneurs. Germany lets computer experts stay permanently. And if you're going to start a business and you invest $1.4 million and create 10 jobs, you get in. In Canada, uh, economic contributors, as they call them, represent the largest portion of immigrants. They favor them. Absolutely we don't. Right. We favor family. We're trying to protect against Al-Qaeda, and we're killing our economy in the process. And I think one of the other problems is the process is so long. In one of the firms that we have, just like yourself, we're actually it hurts, trying to... It hurts your company. It, it hurts our company. And, uh, you know, we create millions of jobs. And, you know, in order for us to get the types of people that can produce uh, in a productive and a creative way, we need the best talents in the, around the world. We are a borderless economy. And technology has overtaken just pure, pure labor as a force of growing that economy. And unless we bring people in that understand how to go about utilizing those technologies, we're really going to go, you know, and take a, a seat back in this world economy. And you, you look at some of these companies, Google, Intel, Sun Microsystems, right. eBay, Yahoo, all have in common immigrant founders. Immigrant founders. People from other countries came here, created all these jobs, and a Dartmouth Business School study did find the companies that outsource the most create the most jobs in America. David Axelrod goes talk to his union friends. You know what he's telling them, and they're telling him. At the end of the day, we end up with policies as well as practices which discourage immigration and discourage innovation, and it's terrible. Thank you, Tom Stenberg and David Park. Coming up, two more CEOs, one who helped build America's second biggest construction material company, another who employs 180,000 people, and sold me a TV set. Tonight, we've been talking to CEOs. Many complain about today's new regulations. The Occupy Wall Street protesters would say, what regulations? Business needs more regulation. And it is natural to think that a regulation will protect us from greedy business types. And the politicians and bureaucrats who impose them sure believe they will. 
rarely do they step back and look at the cumulative total of what the bureaucrats demand. And as of this week, we're up to 160,000 pages of rules. That's what it looks like. You want to start a business? You better read all that or pay someone to read all of it to try to understand it or you could be in big trouble. And again, these are just the federal rules. States and towns have even more. How could anyone possibly read all that and understand it and follow these rules? I know I couldn't, but I assume these two successful CEOs can because they're not in jail. Brad Anderson ran Best Buy. And Stephen Zelnick is chairman of Marietta Materials. So, Stephen, did you read all these? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, if you can't summarize it in one or two pages, uh, you're probably not going to understand it anyway. Well, do you hire people who read them? But you have to obey them. Uh, you, you disobey one, you could be in trouble. You, you do hire people to understand them. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone who ever reads the intimate detail of all those regulations. Just far too complicated. Um, you grew Marietta Materials to a very big company from $450 million in revenue to $2.2 billion. Could you do that today with all these rules? We, we couldn't grow at the same pace. It would be impossible. A lot of the strategy that we employed was to open new quarry operations. Uh, I think we'd be lucky if we could open 25% of the ones we opened up, just trying to overcome uh, the environmental rules in particular. And could you have built Best Buy the way you did with today's rules? No, Best Buy was barely survived for its first 20 years, and it was on the edge of, and it was really just guts and... and if you had and to pay for lawyers if, if, to if, read if, that. There's no way. We couldn't begin to do it. Uh, and you are one of the few honest big business types who are willing to say these rules help you in some ways. He actually had an argument with one of our, our government affairs that came to me at Best Buy and said we should resist these rules. And I said it depends. As an American, I want to resist those rules. As a Best Buy executive, I'm in favor of those rules. We acted against it, against the rules. But the, because the, they the, crush the little Because they crush, right. Like somebody wanting to compete with us can't because we can afford to hire the guys that can read this stuff and keep us in compliance with the law. They can't. And the politicians don't get that, but one who finally did was George McGovern. Yeah, ironically. George, uh, George when he left office as a, as a senator from South Dakota, went and opened a, 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 a hotel. Right, a small little bed and breakfast hotel, and he, he was quoted, He wrote, I wish during the years I was in public office I had this first-hand experience about the difficulties business people face. Public policy does not consider whether we are choking off business opportunities. The growth of technology comes out of this country because of its economic freedom. If we crush that, we also crush our future. And most of these politicians have never run anything, so they don't experience what they impose on others. Tell, tell us how you made Marietta Materials so successful. Well, we focused on people. Uh, I, I have a firm belief that uh, what... Platitude, platitude, yeah, it's, come on. It's, it's platitude, but uh, I really have a firm belief if you get the right people together and energize them, motivate them, that they'll carry you forward to great success. I thought it was a clever idea. You found a new way to ship stuff. We had a novel strategy that we implemented. Uh, we, you ship things by water and rail we, instead of truck. We began to, uh, we, we saw the coastal areas growing. There was no aggregate there. And we set up to cut transportation costs with a rail uh, water network that was integrated. And it was highly successful. But it took us a long time to do it. Uh, we had to be very patient. Uh, even the permitting environmental side of that was very difficult to overcome even for a large company. And you're now horrified by the EPA and its costs, but you were a big supporter of the EPA. I, I was a fan of the EPA. I lived in two areas where I got to experience red air and black snow. And this country clearly needed to be cleaned up. And I think the EPA did a great job of that. Mm -hmm. We're at a point now, and it's been that way for some years, where we're well past it. Uh, they keep layering on, layering on, layering on. Uh, it's become self-serving. It runs for its own special interest. And yeah, I, I would suggest to you that the primary taxing agency of the United States government is not the IRS, it's the EPA. There's so many rules and regulations. Uh, we talked about crushing the small business guy. There's no way the small business person can either understand or pay for these rules. It's imposed at too low a level. Big corporations can handle this, and it is competitive advantage for large corporations. Thank you, Steve Zelnick. Brad Anderson coming up, the financial meltdown that started in 2008 killed lots of jobs and destroyed lots of wealth. 
The CEOs are hostile to most regulation, so what do they say we should do about the bank's reckless lending? That's next.